so amazing to see you all here this morning. God is good. I love when I see uh, the fact that, you know, we... Have you noticed that God does not care how many people are um, listening to him because he cares about the one, the one sheep, right? He leaves the 99 and comes back for the one, and that's important. Today might be the day when you might be that one, and that's okay too. That's okay. I want to um, <clears throat> talk today and, and share with you the, the text that we're going to cover, and it's in Matthew. Uh, Jenny, by the way, if you don't know who the, the blonde was that was here in the front the first time here, that's my wife, Jenny. I call her gorgeous. And the other thing that I also want to mention before I read the text is that whenever you hear Andrew go, wah, wah, you know, you praise God for him, you know, so just... Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for young ones here. Uh, the young ones that serve communion normally um, are out on a little vacation. And look at that beautiful weather. But um, if you have your scriptures with you, your Bibles with you, either electronic or paper, uh, turn please to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we are going to cover verses 17 through 20. Um, so Matthew chapter 5, I would love to read these to you this morning, and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there, and I'm going to show you what I, what I brought and why. But Matthew chapter 5, um, starting with verse 17, says the following. Now this is Jesus saying these words after he's talked about all the people that were poor in spirit, those who mourn, and then a bunch of other individuals, and then it, he, he tells his listeners, you're the salt of the earth. And then he follows with, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of, these, uh, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So I, I brought with me, you know, Jesus mentions the law. Now when you think of the law, what do you think of? All the rules, right? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> All right, so I, um, I don't know where we found this. I think, I think we found it somewhere hidden under a rock somewhere here in the, you know, in the closet somewhere. But this here, or maybe it was donated, I don't remember. Um, but it says the law at the top. And these are the laws. Oh, man, it's heavy. Okay. It says right underneath, the 613 commandments. Whoa. Oh, look at that. And right on, on this side right here, it has the verse that we just read. Okay, it's right here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this right here for us to, to see. And if you wish, at the end of the service... I, at the end of the message, I'm going to leave it here. And if you want to come take a look at those, uh, by all means, by all means. However, I think we need to ground our thinking and our mindset when it comes to the law and the prophets. When Jesus uses the law and the prophets, we gotta, we got to ground our thinking. And I've asked Mike to, to get ready a video that I want you guys to, to see. And this video is about five minutes long. Well, five and a half, Mike? Five, yeah, he's saying yes. So five and a half minutes long, okay? So it's a little longer, but I want you guys to pay attention to this, okay? You have it, Mike? 
Go for it. You're most likely familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Bible, stuff we generally take as good advice. Don't murder, don't steal, honor your parents, the list goes on. And those are just the first ten. There are actually a total of 613 commands, all given to ancient Israel, found in the first five books of the Bible, which in Hebrew are called the Torah. Now the word Torah is usually translated in English as the law, because it has all of these laws in it. And as you read through them, you wonder, Am I supposed to obey some of these, all of these? I mean, what's the purpose of the law? Well, that translation is kind of confusing because while the Torah has laws in it, the book itself is fundamentally a story about how God is creating new kinds of people who are fully able to love God and love others. And when Jesus taught about the Torah, he said that he was bringing that story to its fulfillment. So walk me through the story and how it's fulfilled. So the story begins with God creating humanity who rebels. And God chooses Abraham to bless all of the nations through his family, who end up in slavery down in Egypt, and so God rescues them. Then at Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with Israel, like an agreement. And all of the laws that Moses gives to Israel are the terms of that agreement. They're like a constitution. So some of the laws are about rituals and customs that set Israel apart from the nations. Other laws are about social justice or morality. And by following these, Israel would show the other nations what God is like. Okay, so the rest of the Torah is just a complete list of laws that Moses gives Israel? Mm, no, the rest of the Torah just continues the story. And the 613 commands are only a selection from that original constitution. And even these have been broken up and placed at strategic points within the story. Now pay attention, because you'll see a really clear pattern. Moses gives the first laws to Israel. Yeah, don't worship other gods, don't make idols. And then right after that, there's a story of Israel breaking those very laws. Yeah, they worship the golden calf. And so Moses gives some more laws, and then you get more stories of rebellion. Some more laws, rebellion again, some more laws, more rebellion, and you start to see the point. Right, no matter how many laws, they're just going to continue to rebel. So at the conclusion of the Torah's story, Moses gives this final speech to Israel as they prepare to go into their new home. And he tells them, you guys, I know that you're not going to follow all of God's laws. You've proven to me that you're incapable. And Moses says the problem is that their hearts are hard and that they're going to need new, transformed hearts if they're ever going to truly follow God's law. And he was right. I mean, the story goes on to recount Israel's total failure. They go into the land, they break all the laws. Right. Now, the next section of books in the Jewish tradition are the 15 books of the prophets, and they reflect back on the story. For example, Ezekiel, he said that if Israel was ever going to obey the law, God's spirit would have to transform their hard hearts into soft hearts. And Jeremiah said that's when obedience to God's commands wouldn't feel like a duty, but they would be written deep in their hearts. And Isaiah, he promised a future leader, Israel's Messiah, who will lead all of the people in obedience to the law. Now, in Jewish tradition, all of these books together are called the prophets, even the historical books, because they're continuing the story told from the perspective of the prophets. Okay, so we have the law and the prophets, and they're telling one connected story about God's desire to bless the whole world through a people, Israel, who it turns out needs a new heart. Yes, and Jesus saw himself as continuing that story. So he agreed with the law and the prophets when he taught that it's out of the human heart that come the most ugly parts of human nature. It's like the default setting of our hearts is opposed to God's law. But Jesus also said that he came to solve that problem, and in his words, to fulfill the law. So what does he mean there, to fulfill the law? Well, first he said that the demand of all of the laws in the Torah could be fulfilled by what he called the great command, that we are to love God and to love others. So that seems pretty easy. I mean, we all want to love. Well, we think we want to love. But Jesus showed how love is far more demanding than we realize. So he quotes the law, do not murder. And he says, yes, not killing someone is a very loving thing to do. But then he also says that when you treat someone with disrespect or when you nurse resentment against them, you're also violating God's moral ideal because you're not treating that person with love. And so Jesus said true love ought to extend even to our own enemies. So even though this command seems very simple, Jesus showed how our hearts are not currently equipped to fulfill even this basic command of God to love others. And that's kind of a downer. But where Israel failed, Jesus brought this story to its fulfillment. As Israel's Messiah, he fully loved God and others, and he showed all of the nations what God is truly like. 
He did this through his acts of compassion and mercy and ultimately by loving his enemies even unto death. And after his resurrection, he told his followers that he would send God's Spirit to transform their hearts so that they could follow him and fulfill the purpose of the law, to love God and to love their neighbor. So this fulfills the story of the law and the prophets, or in the words of the Apostle Paul, the one who loves fulfills the law. All right. So that's, that's the mindset that we need in order to get into these texts, these three verses. So here's, here's the, the, the first thing I want to do. I want to cover these verses. I want to highlight a few things in these verses so that we know what the text is saying. And then after that, we're going to say, well, how does this text apply to our 21st century context and living? And then we're going to get into some actions. What can we do? Okay, so the first thing that we heard in the video is that the law, the purpose, is not these. Right? The purpose of the law and the prophets is not these, but rather the narrative, the story. And yes, it certainly includes laws, but the main idea is harmony and coexistence between human beings... And harmony and coexistence between God and human beings. Okay? So that is the entire purpose of the law and the prophets. Harmony and coexistence between us. Now, what I want to do is I want to go into uh, verse 17 and unpack a little bit about this abolish and fulfill. Jesus said it is, he's not here to, he was, he's not here to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And I've heard all sorts of explanations like, well, you know, um, the Old Testament is done. We don't have to do these anymore. And to some extent, that's right. But these two words of abolish and fulfill are so much richer than that. Now, to abolish the law, what Jesus is saying is, I am not here to undermine or misrepresent the law. Because his contemporaries, the leaders, would, were accusing him. It's like, oh, well, he's teaching you the wrong thing. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I'm not here to abolish the law. I am here to fulfill the law. And by the way, fulfill the law was a Jewish idiom, a Jewish expression. And it meant to properly interpret the law. So when Jesus is saying, I'm here to fulfill the law, he is saying, I'm here to show you what the law really means, to properly interpret. And he surely does that in the rest of the, the, the chapters. Like, yeah, you heard you know, people say, don't, don't kill anybody. Well, it actually goes beyond that. So he is properly interpreting the, the law. Now, I want to show you something really, really, really cool. Because the first time I saw it, I was like, whoa, it just blows your mind a little bit. Verse 17 and verse 19 in, in this very uh, chapter right here, there's a parallel between them. Both verses talk about abolishing and fulfillment. Okay? In verse 17, Jesus is, up, is saying that I'm not here to abolish it but to fulfill but then he turns around and says, my followers ought not to abolish or misrepresent the exact language that I read was set aside the smallest commandment or break the smallest commandment and teach others to break the commandment. But rather, and this is where the parallel is, to fulfill. And what does that mean? Well, Jesus is saying, well, to fulfill in my followers the law means that they ought to practice and teach others to practice. Do you see that? Look at this. Uh, Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. And look at verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, no, don't do that. Don't break the smallest law and teach others to do that. Okay? Now, what Jesus is saying, when you fulfill the law, he's saying, I'm here to fulfill the law. His followers are like, well, you ought to practice what I'm teaching you. More than just these rules. It's the narrative. 
That's important. So the narrative of harmony between human beings and between God and human beings is the fulfillment of the law. And as, as a matter of fact, the, the, the video mentioned Romans uh, chapter 13, verse 8. And if I was to turn to there, and, and did you see how quickly I turned? It's because I have a little, a little thing here that I used to go flip. To Romans, you know, if you're not as fast as I am, you can just listen in. All right, so here, here, here it is in Romans 13, uh, Romans 13, verse 8. It says, uh, "Let no doubt remain outstanding, except the the continuing debt to debt to love one another." I like I like that the debt to love one another. We have a debt to love one another. Uh, for here it is. Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. See that? In other words, has in properly interpreted the law and, it, and, and they do and they practice what it was meant to do. But, and, and it continues, actually, it repeats again in verse 10. Verse 10 says, love does no harm to any neighbor, to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay? You're with me on that? All right. So, fulfilling the law, when Jesus says, I am here to fulfill the law, he's saying, look, what I'm about to teach you is the fulfillment of the law. These rules here, it, 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 they're fine, but look at the narrative, the entire narrative. And I'm here to continue that narrative. I'm here to, to help you have harmony with human beings and have harmony with our Father in heaven. If you do what I tell you, if you practice like what I'm showing you to do, you will accomplish that. You will accomplish the law. Now, the law, sometimes I, I use the word harmony, God's harmony. That's what he means. That is the law, the way, they, the things as they ought to be. And then uh, verse 18 here in this text, it gives, gives additional uh, meaning about the law, about the narrative and its teaching, is that they will last. They're not here temporarily. This desire, this, this law, this, this narrative will continue until it is accomplished. Make no mistake, Jesus is saying, nothing on earth will affect the law. The earth and heavens, the created realms will disappear first before the narrative. And the narrative, this harmony, he's saying... That is my purpose. And that is what I'm here to show you. And then Jesus in verse 20. I love this. When I first saw it, it's like, oh, Lord, Jesus, here it is. Now, look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. <gasps> what? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Oh, my gosh. Do you know? How strict these people are in, in following all these? You want us to be more than that? Are you kidding me? But what Jesus is saying, look, look, you won't be able to do that. I came so that I can fulfill, I am the fulfillment of the law and the narrative so that you can have that right living. It's impossible for you to do the right living. The law, the narrative showed it, as the video said. They kept on breaking, they kept on falling, and they kept on rebelling. Jesus is saying, look, unless you reach this, there's no way. And it's impossible for you to do that. That's why I'm here. I am here not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law so that your righteousness rises to the level that it is intended to be at. Righteousness, by the way, is right living. 
And Jesus is saying, look, the right living that I am offering you, you keep on, you keep on practicing my commandments, you keep on doing what I'm, what I'm telling you to do, and then you go and teach others to do the same, you are beginning to experience what it means to have the right kind of life style. The right kind of living. That's righteousness. Righteousness means the right kind of living. And Jesus is saying, look, there's no way. Unless you're like the Pharisees or better. There's no way you can do it. Absolutely no way. So because of that, because you cannot do these, I am here for you. So that as you follow in my footsteps, as you become my apprentice and you listen to what I have to say and then you put it into practice and then you learn my teachings and you try again when you fail and you keep on doing that as your life style you become more and more in the right living that was intended to be all along the narrative the law and that's what this text is all about okay so what do we do with it how do we apply it to the 21st century after all it's been over 2000 years since he has said these words and he said that nothing's going to pass. So the first application here is that God's narrative continues. God's narrative continues to this very day. The goal remains the same. Harmony between human beings and harmony between God and humanity. The challenge, of course, is that humanity thinks they know better. So we say, well, yeah, but. Uh, one common thing that we do is like, well, okay, so I'm okay with this part here, but man, this part here, no, I don't believe in that. And this one here, no, I don't believe that. Yeah. But this one sounds good, so I'll take that. It ain't a menu. Last time I checked, it ain't a menu. Yeah, I'll have uh, two of these with ketchup and fries, please. I mean, no. The narrative continues. And the question is, do we align with the narrative? Or do we make stuff up? Do we align with what he has put into, into, into motion? Or do we think we know better? Especially when we go, God, you're sure about this? That doesn't seem right. You know, maybe you ought to do this. Trust me. Who's the boss? Yeah. And oftentimes says, well, we are so much more evolved now. We are in the 21st century. And we've learned so much from history. We know what human beings ought to be like. So therefore, we're going to make our own rules. And we make those rules. And we get all sorts of silliness on social media. Where people don't know what a man is or what a woman is or who knows what else. A lot of silliness. It's like, wait, what? I, I, Lord, I thought your harmony, okay, well, how do you see it? What's your harmony like? Well, let's go back to the law and prophets, which is the narrative. We don't have to necessarily agree or comprehend it. We just have to trust it. There's so many times when, and I'm reading through the scripture and I'm like, Okay, Lord, so I understand what this is, but you want me to love who? My enemies? That doesn't feel right. I don't like doing it. You know what? I'd much rather love those that love me. I'd much rather be nice to those who are nice to me. As a matter of fact, you know what? I've, I heard people say, if you're nice to me, I'm going to be nice to you. You know where I found that? in and this is sort of scary 
I actually, this is part of the, have you heard of the Satanic Bible? Yeah, it's in there. Their form of love is, no, 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 we love, we think love is amazing. I will love those who love me, and I will be nice to you if you're nice to me. I mean, why shouldn't we? It sounds logical, doesn't it? it? Sounds logical to be like, well, why should I love the person that's mean to me? And when I first understood that it's actually found in the Satanic Bible, I understood how evil that thought is, how demonic that thought is. Sounds good to us human beings, but it ain't the narrative. And the narrative is like, I don't get it. But he's saying if you really want the best harmony possible between human beings, the best harmony possible between human beings and the Lord Almighty, this is what you got to do. Another application is right living righteousness cannot be accomplished apart from Jesus. Just can't. I mean, listen, I know that there's so many wonderful little memes online about, oh, gushy, wishy love and all that, but that ain't the gospel. That, that ain't Jesus. And, and what blows everybody's mind and puts everybody bent out of shape is when you say, look, for the right living to happen, Jesus has got to be central. But you know, human beings know better. That sounds so narrow-minded, so exclusive. It might be. I mean, that's why he gave the narrative. He gave the narrative to show the world and other nations, look, that's not the right way. That's not, the, that's not how you connect and bring harmony between the most high God and humanity. That, that's, you're going the wrong way. What? You're going the wrong way this way. That's the narrative. So when we say Jesus is central to right living, it's not exclusive. It's you're going the wrong way. This way. Another application that we can engage in our 21st century is the fact that practicing, practicing, not just knowing the teachings of Jesus, and then teaching others, engaging into, a, into an, an apprenticeship model to do the same. That is the solution, my friends. That is the solution for harmony. There are so many solutions out there, political solutions, so, uh, psycho psychological solutions, artistic solutions. But when it's all said and done, the narrative points the way. And we've got to practice it. Just because you know it. Just because you believe in a set of doctrines and precepts. That ain't sufficient. There's a story that I tell about the, a great acrobat who is who put a, a cable across Niagara Falls. And apologies for those who have heard me say this or have heard from others say it. So this great acrobat is like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk across Niagara Falls. And sure enough, they put the cable people lined up to see the, the man plunge to his death. But you know what he did? He didn't plunge to his death. He just walked to the other side like, wow, amazing. He walked back, wow, amazing. Oh, watch this. And we can do it a wheel, wheelbarrow. Woohoo! I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. And you know what? I can put a bunch of rocks in here, you know, big boulders or cement or whatever he put in there. So I was like, whoa, how many pounds do you have in there? I don't know, 200 pounds or something. I don't know what he had in there. But it was heavy. It was going back and forth. And I was like, whoa, that's amazing. You can do that. It's like, yeah, I can put a human being here. Who, who thinks that I can put a human being right in here and I can do this? Like, everybody, yeah, you can. We've seen it. 
did this. Okay, come, come, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Let's go. Who's first? Mm -hmm. Not me. <sighs> the difference between believing. <laughs> yeah, you can do it, man. Put a human being in there. <laughs> Steve, you go first. <laughs> and faith, which says, yeah, I'll get him the, I'll get him the real peril. Your emotions don't have to be all serene in your wheelbarrow. You can grip that side until your knuckles are red, blue, yellow, green. <gasps> yes, we call it faith. A life of faith sometimes feels like this. <laughs> that chimney is about to fall. <laughs> okay, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, hang on to the wheelbarrow, people. Come on, come on. Faith versus in the wheelbarrow faith. And the narrative calls us to get in the wheelbarrow. Get in. Yes, you're going to be scared. Yes, your knuckles are going to be like this. Yes, you might perspire or make sure you wear diapers or whatever you need to do to get in the wheelbarrow. But I'm telling you, that's what faith is. Is practicing and going and saying, Lord Jesus, I not only know it. I'm going to trust you. With my job. I'm going to trust you with my family. I'm going to trust you with the surgery coming up. I'm going to trust you with. My marriage, my kids, college, finances, you fill in the blank. Ch chimney? <laughs> Me. <laughs> chimney too. Yes, I guess so. Got to trust them. That's what faith is. All right, so what do we do? What kind of things can we do? What, what specific actions can we take? I'm going to suggest three of them as <laughs> people are like, Pastor, you always have three points. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. I'm a creature of habit. I apologize. You know, maybe one of these days I'll surprise you. I'll have seven points. <laughs> Marlene is like, no, two, two points. <laughs> um, all right, so here's some actions. Action number one. Train yourself. It's not going to come easy, so you, have to, you need training. Train yourself to see and then be part of God's narrative, his law, his harmony. It's going on today. So you got to train yourself to see the world differently. you got to train yourself to see the church differently. Train yourself to see yourself differently, your family, everything that you have. Train yourself to see in a different way, in a narrative kind of way. How do you do that? Well, I'm glad you asked because it starts with a decision. But it, if Jesus is not central to your lifestyle, you need to adjust three things. Let me say this again. If Jesus is not central to your lifestyle, not an add-on. You know what an add-on Jesus feels like? Man, I got everything going, or you know, I'm going through some troubles, or you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to church, and you know, it's nice because I need a good message. And after that, oh, I feel so much better. Good, I'm going to go home. A good message is nice, but then is Jesus central to your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? I mean, don't get me wrong. Hearing a good message is good. You know, Lord Jesus, don't, you know, I mean, listen, the time you have me give a, a, a bad message, and they'll come, and they'll be, maybe this is the one, I don't know. Uh, but when you hear a bad message, you know, that's a valuable thing too. And I think I've mentioned this before. When you hear a bad message, thank God that it's not about me. 
right? Praise God for bad messages. It's about Him. Central. If Jesus is central to your lifestyle, adjust three things. Adjust your attitude, priorities, and decisions. Those are very specific things. Adjust your attitude, adjust your priorities, and adjust your decisions. Which means that valuing getting together and being re-energized values more than whatever else is happening on Sunday. Do you understand that? We've got to adjust attitude. We've got to adjust priorities. If church is just priority, oh yeah, I'll make it if I can. Uh, just do a double check on that. Priorities and then decisions. Now, here's, the, here's something very specific that you can do. Be part of learning the narrative. Be part of learning the narrative. Find any excuse to learn the narrative. Wednesdays, we have Bible study here on Wednesdays. That is a chance to learn the narrative. Well, what are we going to cover? Who cares? If it's in the Bible, we got to cover it. It doesn't matter what topic we're discussing. It's the fact that we are going to dive into the narrative. So come be part of the community Bible study on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Make it a priority. Adjust your schedule. Now, what if the, those of you that are like, oh, I can't do it on Wednesday. My goodness. Okay, fine. Then here's what you do. You know, you ready? Bug me. Pastor, we got to start another Bible study on a different date so that I can make it. And you bug me and badger me and, and, and corner me until we start another Bible study in a time and place that you can make it. Why? Because Jesus is central to your lifestyle, not an add-on. Can make it on Wednesday? No problem. I expect some of you to bug me. God bless you. Bug me. Be after me to start another one. And we'll figure it out. Wednesday, 7 o'clock. It's a good time to get into the narrative. Because if we don't know the narrative and don't study the narrative, we don't know the teachings of the master. And we can't see his example and how we put it into practice. And how we become apprentices. Moment by moment. Part of the lifestyle. Do you understand? Well, that's all I prepared for today. And thank God, because otherwise, you know, we'll be here for another half an hour. So I'm going to invite Nate to come back up here, my friend. And let's, uh, let's praise God with one more song.